News of the Times, History News Story. Stories of Executioners. In today's episode, we switch places with the usual criminal and murderers and take a look at some of the hangmen of the Times. The stories look at three executioners of their day. 1663, the original Jack Ketch, whose name then becomes the colloquial term for an executioner. 1714, John Price, who worked as a hangman in England before he himself was hanged. And in 1829, William Calcraft, a name our regular listeners will certainly recognise. We hope you enjoy the show. The Executioner's Role In the 17th century, the generic name for the hangman was Jack Ketch. In the 17th century, hangmen tended to be more ostracised from the ordinary populace, and the job was not deemed one which required much skill but did require a strong stomach. We do not have information of how much the local hangmen were paid, but we do know the fee would range between £2 and £5 per person around about 1830, the equivalent of between approximately 260 and £650 per person executed in London. The original Jack Ketch. There was actually a real Jack Ketch who served as executioner for 23 years in London. He started his role in 1663 through to 1686. His job role included burnings and beheadings in addition to the usual hanging. Jack Ketch's two most famous executions were Lord William Russell, for his part in the plot against King Charles II. The execution did not go well, with it taking Ketch four axe blows in 1683 before he finally managed to decapitate him. Nobility were expected to be treated with some respect, even when being executed, and Ketch was made to formally apologise. The second famous Ketch execution was that of the Duke of Monmouth in 1685 for treason. Again, the execution procedure required several blows with the axe before the Duke of Monmouth was successfully beheaded. From 1686 we jump to 1714, and the dramatic story of John Price. The few stories we have of John Price would indicate that he seems to have spent his life just skirting the law and in a regular position of being in debt. On one occasion, when his accumulated debts put him in prison, he and an accomplice dug a hole in the prison wall to escape. The crime that made him the executioner who was executed is recounted below, and it's from the Newgate calendar. The style of writing at the time can be unwieldy, so we have added some context to help clarify. From the Newgate calendar, John Price, a rogue and liar who was not believed when he spoke the truth. He held the office of common hangman and was himself hanged in Bunhill Fields in May 1718 for murdering a woman. John Price background. This criminal first drew his breath in the fog end of the suburbs of London and, like Mercury, became a thief as soon as ever he peeped out of the shell. Fortune having reduced his miserable parents to such extremity that they could not bestow on their son any education. It was his misfortune to improve himself in all manner of wickedness before he had turned seven. 
So prone was he to vice that as soon as he could speak, he would curse and swear with as great a passion and vileness as is frequently heard around any gaming table. Moreover, to this unprofitable talent of profaneness, he added that of lying. John Price's first time in jail and reprieve. When John Price was about 18 years of age, a gentleman with whom he lived in the country turned him out of his service purely on account of his excessive lying. One time when John Price going toward London, he robbed a market woman of about 18 shillings near Brentwood in Essex. He was taken by some travellers coming suddenly on him in the act and committed by a magistrate to Chelmsford Jail. He pleaded guilty at the assizes and he received the sentence of death. But his late master, being then High Sheriff of the County of Essex and taking compassion on his servant's misfortunes, did not permit his sentence to be put into force against him. The sheriff said he knew the fellow to be such an uncountable liar that there was no believing one word he said. So his pleading guilty to what was laid to his charge was, in his opinion, an eminent sign he ought to be believed innocent of the fact, and he would not be guilty of hanging an innocent man for the world. John Price in Newgate Prison Soon after this escape, John Price made the best of his way to London, where he associated himself with the tribe of pickpockets and gypsies, with whom he ran up and down the country, frequenting all fairs and concourses of people, till he was caught diving into a pocket that was not his own, and committed to Newgate in Bristol. John Price in the Royal Navy being there severely whipped for his fault, he went on board a merchant ship and afterwards served in two men of war, but not forbearing to pilfer from the seamen after having been whipped at a gun, pickled with brine and keyholed, he was discharged. John Price as highwayman. Coming ashore at Portsmouth, he got to beloved London again, where he would not hearken to any wholesome counsel, but resolved to break through all virtuous sentiments and wholly betake himself to all manner of wickedness. Entering himself into a gang of footpads. For our listeners, a footpad was a colloquial term for highwaymen. They one night divided themselves into three bands, and an attorney then falling into their hands near Hampstead, his money they demanded, with a thousand oaths and curses. According to their demand, he gave them what money he had about him, which was eight guineas, rejoicing howsoever that he had now passed, as he thought, all danger, when, lo, suddenly, as he came up, the halfway house betwixt that place and London, he was again surrounded with a second band of these rogues who went to him and demanded whence he came and where he was going. He related his piteous adventure into what cruel hands he had fallen. Cruel, answered one of the gang, how durst you use these terms and who made you so bold as to talk to us with your hat on? Pray, sir, be pleased henceforward to learn more about manners. Saying which, they snatched his hat and wig off his head and took a diamond ring off his finger, in all to the value of fifteen pounds. What could our poor lawyer now do? To turn back again was to leap out of the frying pan and into the fire. Wherefore, he faintly went on. When scarcely had he got past Kentish Town, but the third band who lay as sentinels in this place made up to him, 
bringing along with them a man who had not a rag of clothes on his back, not so much as a shirt, a dreadful thing, considering the time of the year, it being then in the depth of winter. Sir, said John Price, you'll do a charitable deed to let this poor wretch, whom we have seen just now strip, have your upper coat, or rather both upper and under, for you see he is almost dead with cold. The lawyer would willingly have pl pleaded that charity begins at home, and that every man is bound by the laws of nature to conserve his own rather than another's, but alas, his judges were other kinds of men than he, to be removed by the laws of the land or nature either. They took from him both his coats and his waistcoat, telling him it was a favour that they took not from him his life also, seeing he had made such bad use of it. John Price at Newgate Prison Being at last committed to Newgate for petty larceny, he was only whipped at the cart's tail, and upon paying his fees, obtained his liberty again. John Price as the Hangman Afterwards, endeavouring to mend his fortune by marriage, he entered into the state of matrimony with a young woman called Betty, whose employment was to attend daily at the jail of Newgate and run prisoners' errands. By this means, and his own good behaviour, he quickly raised himself to preferment, for he was made hangman for the county of Middlesex. But the first day he officiated at the sessions at the Old Bailey, going to the Blue Boar Alehouse, situated not far from Justice Hall, it was his misfortune to have his burning irons picked out of his pocket, for which he was forced to pawn his waistcoat to have them back again. For our listeners, burning irons used by the execution were for the purpose of burning on the hand or sometimes face, as a form of punishment. However, he soon retrieved this loss, for what with slightly putting a T, which was the only letter he knew in the whole alphabet, on a thief's hand, and correcting others with a gentle lash, he redeemed his waistcoat and bought a shirt into the bargain. Moreover, at the first cast of his office, he performed at Tyburn, he made as much off the executed person's clothes among the brokers in Monmouth Street and Chick Lane as procured him several drunken bouts. Indeed, he was a man in every way qualified for this station, for he had impudence in abundance, cruelty at his finger ends, drunkenness to perfection, and could swear as well without a book as within. The crime that got John Price executed. What brought him to his end was his going one night over Bunhill Fields in his drunken airs when he met an old woman named Elizabeth White, a watchman's wife who sold pastryware about the streets. John Price violently assaulted her in a barbarous manner, almost knocking one of her eyes out of her head, giving her several bruises about her body, breaking one of her legs, and wounding her in the belly. Whilst he was acting this inhumanity, two men came along at the same time, and hearing dreadful groans, supposed somebody was in distress and having the courage to pursue the sound as well as they could, at last came up to the distressed woman, which made Price damn them for their impudence. However, they secured him, and brought him to the watch-house in Old Street, from whence a couple of watchmen were sent to fetch the old woman out of Bunhill Fields, who within a day or two died under the surgeon's hands. Price was sent to Newgate, where he seemed to be under a great surprise and concern for the death of the woman, till, 
being tried and condemned for her, he was no sooner confined in the condemned hold than laying aside all thoughts of preparing himself for his latter end. He appeared quite void of all grace. Instead of repenting for his manifold sins and transgressions, he would daily go up to the chapel intoxicated with cursed Geneva, comforting himself even to the very last that he should fare as well in a future state as those who had gone the same way before him. John Price's Execution At length, the fatal day came wherein he was to bid adieu to the world, which was on Saturday, the 31st of May, 1718. As he was riding in the cart, he several times pulled a bottle of Geneva out of his pocket to drink before he came to the place of execution, which was in Bunhill Fields, where he committed the murder. Having arrived at the fatal tree, he was, upon Mr. Ordinary's examination, found so ignorant on the ground of religion, he troubled himself not much about it. But valuing himself upon his former profession of being hangman, styled himself finisher of the law, and so was turned off the gibbet aged upwards of forty years. One would imagine that the dreadful scenes of calamity to which this man had been witness, if they had not taught him humanity, would at least have given him wisdom enough not to have perpetrated a crime that must necessarily bring him to a similar fateful end to what he had so often seen of others. But perhaps his profession tended rather to harden his mind than otherwise. The murder of which Price was guilty appears to have been one of the most barbarous and unprovoked we ever remember to have read of, and his pretense that he was drunk when he perpetrated it was no sort of excuse, since drunkenness itself is a crime, and one which frequently leads to the commission of others. From 1718 and the life of John Price, we jump to 1829 to 1874 and the longest-serving executioner, William Calcraft. Listeners will easily recognise his name as the most prolific of executions within our many stories of murder. Calcraft's first London execution was of Esther Hibner the Elder, whose story we recounted under the episode When Employers Go Bad. About William Calcraft. William Calcraft was born in 1800 and was one of the longest serving executioners. He served for 45 years as the official executioner for the City of London and Middlesex. He originally had been employed to flog juvenile offenders at Newgate Prison, a job, it was said, that he took particular delight in. He ascended to the role of executioner in 1829 upon the death of his predecessor, John Foxton. It has been estimated that Calcraft performed more than 450 executions in his lifetime. The Executions There are many viewpoints of Calcraft. His usual hanging method was of the short drop. With this method, the felons being hanged often strangled to death, sometimes relatively slowly. Calcraft was known to run down the stairs and hang on the legs of the victim, swinging from their legs from side to side to speed up the process, or climbing on their shoulders to help expedite the dying process. Or, if he was feeling particularly vindictive, he didn't, whilst the prisoners being executed slowly strangled to death with all the associated bodily contortions, one hanging was recorded as having taken the victim 17 minutes to slowly die. 
His detractors stated that he got considerable enjoyment in this spectacle and craved the publicity. Calcraft was known to have stated several times that he did not enjoy executing women. However, there is no real evidence of this to confirm or deny that claim. Calcraft took credit for having invented the leather pinioning waist belt that would restrict the prisoner's hands before the hood and noose were placed over the convicted head. Additional bonuses. In addition to his normal wages, like John Price above, Calcraft would collect and keep the clothes and belongings of the convicted he executed. Madame Tussauds would often speedily put up displays of the latest renowned executed criminals, and Calcraft, for a fee, would supply the now executed criminals' effects that he did not wish to keep to Madame Tussauds for their displays. Groans of the Gallows, 1847 This book, in an expose format, paints an ugly picture of William Calcraft. The book recounts Calcraft's supposed lack of feeling regarding the executed's families. It states, He appropriates whatever property might be on the person of those he executes, including the clothes they die in, unless, when especially ordered in accordance with the dying wish of a favoured criminal to be given to the survivors, for the value of which he is allowed. Meaning, if a family wished to have their loved one's things, they would have to pay Calcraft for them. It also discusses Calcraft's preference for short drop hangings, intimating Calcraft's enjoyment of the spectacle of himself swinging on the legs of the slowly dying felon. Longer drop hanging increased the likelihood of the prisoner's neck breaking relatively quickly. William Calcraft died in 1879. And that concludes this News of the Times episode of Stories of Executioners. We really hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, please subscribe and tell your friends. Subscribing really helps us. We are aiming for 1,000 subscribers. If you have already subscribed, thank you. We very much appreciate your support. We upload longer Regency or Victorian crime stories four times a week, with shorter Regency or Victorian stories on other days to give a flavour of the times. For our podcast listeners, you can see this podcast with the associated pictures on our YouTube channel at News of the Times. You can find the link in the show notes. Thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.